Lord, I just pray that we um, take a deep breath and just pause in your presence, Father, that we know that you're here. We feel that you're here, Lord, that these mornings are crazy. And I just, Lord, I thank you and, and I'm humbled by each and every woman, each heart that is in here, Lord, that you love so deeply. Father, I pray for Dee Dee that your Holy Spirit just breathes right through her and into our hearts, Lord, that you permeate our hearts, that any walls that are up, anything that is in our way of hearing you and hearing your truth, seeing your treasure in your word, Lord, I pray that those those walls and those barriers come down. Father, I pray for Dee Dee that she just um, speaks right directly to us, and I thank you for her obedience and her love for your word, Lord, that's just transcending into all of us. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord. And we lift all of these things up to your beautiful son's name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. We were sitting there going, boy, that's Nehemiah. The Life Builders is so much like that. And this week you could see all the obstacles and problems that these people in Nehemiah had to go to. When I first started reading, reading Nehemiah, I was so impressed by this man who was willing to just pick up and go and undertake this enormous task that, uh, and organize these people and build that wall. Uh, amazing skills to be able to do that. But how his focus and determination was incredible. But when I read these chapters and what he had to deal with, the enemies and the obstacles, I was even more impressed. Just a few things happening in these two chapters, right? Very discouraging things for Nehemiah and the people. And they kept piling on. Let me read you a few that I came up with. Ridicule, sarcasm, scorn and contempt, hatred, physical threats, discouragement, weariness, fear, internal strife, abuse, greed, corruption, injustice, breaking the law. And they're going to keep on coming as we go through this story. Have you ever struggled with any of these things that you saw Nehemiah struggling with? In fact, I, worked, uh, I thought it finally occurred to me the word discouragement was dis meaning uh, oh, take away or, or the opposite of courage. Discourage is um, a definition of it is to cause someone to lose confidence or enthusiasm. So boy, did he have a lot of things coming at him. Nehemiah was bombarded with disheartening things, um, and it was a hard time he was going through. It was not a great and gl glorious story as he's walking through it. It is to us. It's an it's an encouraging story, but to him it had to be really tough days as they stress this. Now, we know the end of this amazing story. We know that it all came out well. The wall was built. The nation went on. But Nehemiah didn't. He was living this daily with the daily stressor, uh, pressures and stress of not knowing how this was going to end, if the people would, you know, persevere, if his enemies would be defeated, if the wall would be built. Uh, and he did not know that his name and work would be recorded for generations to come. So it wasn't a glorious time uh, that he was going through. Every day, facing a lot of hard work and difficult circumstances and enemies all, on all sides. I once heard somebody said, the problem with life is it's so daily. <laughs> and he was living that. If I had been in Nehemiah's shoes, I was thinking about, boy, the excuses I could have come up with. So I wrote some down. Nobody seems to want this wall, so I might as well go home. Nobody appreciates what I'm doing. Just let them do it. Try and do it. I didn't know it would be this hard. I didn't sign up for this. I'm a cupbearer. What do I know about building or managing people or warfare? Uh, and here's mine. This is, this is definitely what I would say when the um, threats were coming. This is getting dangerous. Somebody could get hurt. We need to back down and let things cool off. Uh, nobody can build a wall under these circumstances. Or how about this one? These people are not worth putting myself out for. They're even abusing each other. I think I better go back to my old job and pray and think about this some more. <laughs> so I asked my husband about it. And he, I said, what kind of excuses would you come up with? And he said, this is above my pay grade. <laughs> So there were just all kinds of outs for Nehemiah that he never took. And I found myself continually asking why, how, what was motivating him, what kept him in there, uh, why did he hang in, why was he able to persevere. So 
In your sheet, I listed the problems and the responses, but I, as I go through these, I'm gonna go through them very quickly. You're gonna have great discussions about these because you're gonna be able to uh, identify with a lot of them. But <clears throat> it's interesting that he handled each problem differently, but there's something the same. There's something the same in each situation. We're gonna look at that. And then the last one at the bottom, after that line, is Nehemiah's personal example. And here he shares the focus behind everything he did. And there is a focus here that I want to say I totally missed the whole summer I was studying this book. I totally missed this focus. And I feel this focus, I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but I think it's a perspective that powerfully defeats discouragement about anything. So we'll get to that. We'll work our way to that. And the first problem seems rather benign uh, when compared to the rest, but it is deadly. And that is the problem of ridicule or scorn. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That is one of the most false statements out there. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it is a deadly one. So try to imagine, I'm going to read through this, try to imagine the tone. I wish, this is where you wish you could hear how they said it. But uh, Nehemiah's old enemy, Salabat, here spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria. So it's the same old enemy, but he's got a bigger audience now, which makes it much more intimidating, and he carries an air of authority as he says this. And he said, what are these feeble, these weak or frail Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? In other words, is God going to come down and do it for them? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive? Can they bring back to life the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? So what, what's the tone here? What is he saying about the people? You're weak. You're inferior. You're inadequate. And your building materials, they're weak, inferior, inadequate. And then Tobiah pipes up another, uh, the same old enemy. The Ammonite was near him and said, ah, even if what they're building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. So he's saying the finished product is going to be uh, inadequate and inferior. Your people and your project are worthless. How would they have felt, these poor, weary wall builders, when this is coming at them? And criticism with humor is some of the most unkind criticism of all. You can't, you can't respond to criticism with humor. There's no, there's no comeback. There's no um, way to counter that. Words are powerful. Verbal abuse can cause deeper and more lasting damage to a child than physical abuse, some physical abuse. My mom used to say, give a child a reputation and they will live up to it or down to it. It can be true for adults as well. We can heal from these hurts, but the scars remain and we find ourselves triggering or reacting stronger than we should when anybody goes near that sore, tender area. Even as adults, even we have a mental understanding of it, those scars remain. And if you think about it, these statements have some credibility to them, don't they? They are partly true. And I've, I've said this before, a good lie has some element of truth to it. The people aren't seasoned professional bricklayers. They're a ragged band of exiles, as Chuck Swindoll said. The wall can't be finished in a day. They are dealing with rubble and burned stones, and it probably looked pretty primitive compared to the original stones that had been there. And they may have worried about its strength as they built this wall. But a lot of it was a lie, or at least it was beside the point. First of all, they weren't trying to finish, in, finish it in a day, were they? They weren't trying to turn the rubble into stones, just a wall. This somehow used them. And they were able to restore it themselves. So I guess they weren't so frail after all, right? And the wall itself was a, probably an amazingly strong wall. I researched it, and it's difficult to know, to really get a good idea of what Nehemiah's wall looked like because Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70 and rubble turned to rubble again, So you, and then built up on that, and then built up on that. So you have to dig really far down to get to Nehemiah's wall. But here's a couple places where they think they found it. The upper part, see the nice stones up there? See the lower part? They're pretty sure that's Nehemiah's wall there. Um, 
It's not the prettiest construction. It indicates they were in a hurry. Somebody said there's a rush nature to this construction. And here's an another one, which they're almost positive is Nehemiah's wall. And what's interesting ab about that picture is you can see it looks like they put bigger stones on the outside and then they filled in the inside with rubble. So the inside is broken up stones, dirt, debris in the inside. And I showed that to my husband, who's an engineer, and he said, that would make for a really strong wall. You can't knock those outer stone walls, uh, bricks down with the rubble in the middle. So, uh, interestingly, it was a fox was not going to knock that wall down. Well, how did Nehemiah react to these taunts, abuses? Hear, O oh our God, how we are despised or scorned. Underline, hear, O oh our God. He tells God on him. Believers are never without an advocate. We always have someone to run to. All the words that David used, God is our refuge, uh, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my shield, my stronghold. Nehemiah is pouring out his heart here, isn't he? I, I don't know what his tone of voice sounded like, but it was desperate. And behind his action and statement is the expectation that God is, God is for them. You go running to somebody like that, that he cares when they hurt. And when they hurt, he hurts. And he will understand and act on their behalf. How should we react when unkind hurts and criticisms, undeserved criticisms come our way? You run to the one who loves you, don't you? You want to run to the one who believes that you are made just right for the way he designed you to be. Nehemiah runs to the arms of, a ch of God like a child runs to a loving person. How do you feel when a child comes running to you with their hurt? I think that's how God felt. I had a, a night a couple weeks ago, or 2 a.m. You know how it is at 2 a.m.? Every pro problem is magnified tenfold. Some were minor, some were kind of, you know, they really were a concern on my heart. And I'd start with one, and then I'd dismiss it and try and go back to sleep, and another one would pop up. And I'm going through, just one after another, and laying there, churning. And finally I said, Lord, you want me to sleep. You don't, I'm not accomplishing anything here about with all this worrying. And so I, I was not totally awake, you know how you're in the, and so I just started praying. And every time a pop, problem popped in my mind, I go, okay, Lord, you know all about that one. You can take care of it. And these were the, it, this was the most unsophisticated prayer in the world. It was just a childlike prayer going, Lord, I, would you take care of that one? And then uh, I'd kind of, and then another one popped. Okay, Lord, there's another one. Would you, you know, you can deal with that. I, you don't want, and I was just going through it. And pretty soon I went back to sleep. I thought, man, I should listen to my own teaching. <laughs> So the rest of the prayer Nehemiah prays here, I didn't put it up on the screen, but it, it's really shocking and quite harsh. They call these um, imprecatory psalms or prayers. And David prayed a lot of psalms or prayers like this. And I put some notes in your homework to kind of explain these. And if you're still troubled by them, on the back of your sheet, at the bottom, is a little box. And it's a good article you, you can read. We looked at that one when we went through the psalms about imprecatory psalms and the Christian ethics. But these are psalms or prayers that invoke judgment, calamity, curses upon one's enemies or those perceived as the enemies of God. Now, it can be right to be disturbed about sin. We should be. And it's good that Nehemiah shared his pain with God openly and honestly. You could hear the groans and the anger and the despair. Nehemiah, interestingly, did not take matters into his own hands, but he laid it out before, the, before God. He invited God in. And he, God was seen as the one who judges. These enemies were consistently show, had consistently shown themselves to be totally against Israel, against God's plan of salvation for the world. Their heart was one of vengeance, murder, deception, and lies. And as governor in charge, Nehemiah asked for God's judge, justice to be done. And remember, too, this was the remnant coming back. We, we talk, I talked about this at the very end of the introduction. This little group of people was going to be the people the lineage, 400 years later, that what? Who's going to come through this group of people? The Messiah is going to be traced back to this lineage. So Nehemiah saw this as an attack on God's plan of salvation for the world. And he is rightly angry and uh, asking for justice and retribution on these people. Now today, because of Christ's 
forgiveness. We walk in grace. We are to forgive and love our enemies. We are not to take vengeance, but to overcome evil with good. So this is not an appropriate prayer for us to be praying, but we certainly can pray for truth to be known and for evil to be exposed and stopped. We can pray that, but we again, we leave it in God's hands. So this prayer invited God into the fray and enabled the people to move on in spite of the ridicule. And after the prayer, Nehemiah, uh, Chuck Swindoll said, Nehemiah probably got up from prayer and said, hand me a brick, hand me another brick. And they moved on. So it says they built the wall till it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart and had a mind to work. Taking it to God was what propelled them on. And if you wanted to write something down, uh, they cast their cares on the Lord and persevered. But that didn't stop the enemies. In fact, it seemed to fuel their hatred. When their enemies saw that their intimidation and verbal abuse hadn't worked, they got very angry and stepped it up a notch. And so your next one is that threats of attack. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. All of them, they're surrounded, east, west, north, south, by these enemies. But what did they do again? And underline, but we prayed to our God. Nehemiah goes to God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Are you seeing this consistent response first and foremost? Take it to the Lord. World War II soldiers who were facing a terrible evil force had a phrase and a song. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. <laughs> Putting your trust in God doesn't mean inaction. It doesn't mean throwing common sense out the window. We don't do that either. We pray for our safety, for our family, for our home, but we lock the door. Uh, if we've lost a job, we pray for a job, but we hit the road and send out resumes. We pray for those in need, but we set up ministries like Life Builders uh, to help people and um, encur um, encourage them. Prayer usually translates into activity, into direction and guidance and action. So they prayed for protection and they carried and took action. They carried on. Well, did this opposition and threat and put down have any effects on them? Were they impervious to it? No. First comes weariness. The strength of the laborers is giving out, wavering, faltering, stumbling. And there's so much trouble that we cannot rebuild the wall. And again, let's look at that statement. Some of it's true, some of it isn't. They were getting physically and probably emotionally weary. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is go get some sleep. You know what? There's sometimes my husband goes, I think you need to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. But sometimes life puts you in a situation, a sick child, whatever, a family crisis that allows you very little relief and rest, and they were in that situation. They could not stop to rest. And consider, I think, they probably weren't just physically and emotionally weary. They must have had cuts and bruises and muscle soreness and you name it. Also, Nehemiah said they were halfway through. What is that halfway point? You ever, I've always remembered that one. It can be very discouraging. The newness has worn off, and you look at what you've done, and you go, I have to do it all over again. And this time, the second half, you know all the obstacles that you ran into that you had no idea you were going to run into in the first half. And the problem with work is it's work. <laughs> right. Uh, I can't imagine all the problems that they, uh, arose as they constructed this wall. My husband and I have an agreement. I tell him, never tell me it's a 10-minute job. <laughs> never. Because 10 days later... <laughs> maybe it's done another thing that was true is there was a lot of rubbish what happens when you go to clean out a closet or a room it gets more messy and what happens to your vision you forget you forget what you were going for and what you want it to, to look like and with, uh, Chuck Swindoll said when you lose strength and vision you lose confidence because earlier they had a mind to work they had worked at it with all their heart but now Discouragement has zapped their enthusiasm and strength. But one thing that wasn't true when they, in that statement is they said the wall could not be rebuilt. It was rebuilt in 52 days. I can't imagine. A two, what was it, Rosemary? Two and a half miles long? 
39 feet high, eight feet wide. I heard your faith lift, sisters. I'm going, ooh, that's good. I should have written it down. Eight feet, eight feet wide. And there are places where it was even wider than that. I think the broad wall was. And the towers and gates, very difficult construction. It looked impassable, but it wasn't because God was, God's good hand was on them. Well, the enemy sensing their weakness um, hits harder and steps up their intimidation. I really feel Satan wants, loves to come at us when we're down. And we see to this weariness, we add fear. Also, our enemy said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and kill them and put an end to this work. Can you imagine how that felt? They're tired. And then the Jews who live near them, they weren't helping. They told us 10 times over, so they're exaggerating the fear. Whenever you turn, they will attack us. So it sounds much more threatening and frightening. And just because you've addressed and overcome something one time doesn't mean your enemy won't try it again. And that in itself is discouraging. They you know, they put this enemy down and it's not helping. And that's where I would have voiced the, that concern. This is getting dangerous. Somebody could get hurt. We need to stop <laughs> and pull back a little bit. Well, how seriously did Nehemiah take these threats? Deadly seriously. Um, remember, don't look at this from the end of the story. See it in the present. Nehemiah had every reason to believe they would attack. They were certainly capable. And as the pressures, but as the pressures intensify, Nehemiah intensified his prayers and preparation, and he took measures to protect the people. I thought he sounded like an army general here. How many hats did this man wear? He was construction. Uh, he was organization. He was um, social director. He was pastor and preacher, and now he's an army general here. Then I stationed the men in the lowest parts of the space between the wall and the exposed places. And then I stationed the people and families. That was a good idea. With their swords and spears and bows, you fight a lot harder when you're with your family, right? And when I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Underline, remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. What was Nehemiah doing here? Getting their eyes on the Lord and their love for other people and off of themselves. Remember the Lord. Remember the victories he's gotten you through. People like to keep a Keep a prayer journal for that very reason, so they can go back. Because it's so easy to forget those victories. You know, you start struggling with a new problem, and what's the first thing? But can he do it for me now? You know, I know he did it 1,500 billion times before, but can he do it for me now? Um, I heard, a t uh, listening to a talk, a Wednesday night talk by Cody Wilson, on the number one thing that can ruin your life is fear. And he, just a couple things I wrote down. Fear forgets God. Faith remembers him. And courage says yes to, to God in the face of fear. He said the safest place you can ever be is in the will of God. Nehemiah knew that. He, they set their eyes on God, and God confirmed it. Uh, David used to say, King David, I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And he also told them to fight for their loved one. Discouragement can make us very self-centered, very focused, very closed in. One of the best remedies to do when you're discouraged or depressed is to reach out to others and get your mind off yourself and open up your focus. So here we can see the thing they did. They focused on God's strength and their love for others and returned to the wall, each one to their own work. Praise the Lord and... Pass me a brick. <laughs> Did you notice that Nehemiah didn't scold the people for their fears? I thought that was interesting. When he saw their fear, how did he react? He didn't scold them. He put up more defenses to encourage them. He gave them comfort. He used common sense. Chuck Swindoll said, when Saul was after David, he ran like mad. When opposition intensified, he ran faster. When it got worse, he hid in more obscure places. He wasn't oblivious to the danger. Even the enemy, in the end, realized God's hand had frustrated their plans. 
But Nehemiah continued to do even more. Everyone carrying weapons, a trumpet always by his side, men staying in the city at night to help act as guards, he and his men always having a weapon. And uh, so this was obviously a very fearful situation, a real threat. And al uh, also, I think, this defense was a very powerful message to the enemy. We're not backing down. And if you come at us, we're ready to defend ourselves. Isn't it interesting that they never attacked? Never attacked. And the last one, this is the one that I think was really a stickler. Conflict among the community. It, it, it said, as if Nehemiah hadn't faced enough from external people and circumstances, he gets it from within. And I believe this was the one that concerned Nehemiah the most. He had moved on past the initial taunts in chapter 2, pretty much said, that's not your business and you have no say in it. He cast his cares on the Lord when the taunts got more cruel, and he prayed and set up a good defense when threatened. But this one, I think, really got to him. Now the, there was a great outcry, the men and their wives, uh, outcry against the people and the men and their wives against their Jewish brothers. So here we say richer Jews were exploit, exploiting their poorer brethren in several different ways. And this made Nehemiah angry, verse 6, very angry. The word anger in verse 6 means vehemently hot, to glow, to grow warm, burning. <laughs> so as you can see from his response and the measures he took, that he regarded this behavior as extremely threatening. He held a great assembly against them. He said that their behavior was not good, and that means it was very bad. He said, shouldn't you walk in the fear of our Lord? You can wa underline, walk in the fear of our God. Again, focus on God. By their behavior, they were consistently slandering God's name, he said, to the other nations. And I love the exc exclamation in verse 10. Let this exacting of usury stop. He was angry. He made them make amends, verse 11, pay the people back. And if, the, if that wasn't enough, he made them take an oath to which he attacked a curse if they didn't follow through with it. He was serious. To the people's credit, they responded just the way they should have. They followed the Lord's will and corrected their behavior. They repented. They went 180 degrees the other way, giving back what they had taken. And they said, Amen to the oath and praise the Lord. And it said, Then the people did according to this promise. The fact that Nehemiah had such a strong reaction to this internal conflict it tells us something. Which is more dangerous, external um, or internal conflict? Internal conflict can tear you apart faster than anything. I worry about our nation, the internal conflict going on. I also think that the, state, that the supplemental information Nehemiah inserts at the very end of chapter 5, all of a sudden he goes off on what he did, right? about himself, portrays how deeply he was concerned about the people's conduct. He draws a very stark contrast between what he did and what the past governors had done and the behavior of others. He didn't take what he was due as governor of that region. He didn't take the food he was allotted. He didn't charge taxes. He didn't acquire land. In fact, he worked side by side with them on the wall. And he, in addition, he sent tons of people, apparently at his own expense, as governor of the region. As a political appointee, he was not it, in it for perks, power, or prestige. How did that compare to the governors of his day before him? Totally different. How did that compare to the richer Jews who were exploiting their poorer brethren? How does that compare to many political appointees of our day? <laughs> so, you know, the, these people had nothing to say. By comparison, they couldn't, they couldn't defend their greedy behavior. But what I really want to focus on is the two statements in that last sec segment. When it reveals what dictated his behavior, what motivated his life, what kept him from getting discouraged. And I think that it's an even deeper why behind what he did. In fact, on your sheet, I wrote, oh, I'm sorry. That's the fourth one. They followed the Lord's will and corrected their behavior. Now, on your sheet, you can see the two reasons he gave, but I did not do so because of the fear of God or out of reverence for God. I did not act like that, one version reads. And remember me, oh my God. Those are his two statements. 
<clears throat> his focus on God was the focus he gave to the people in all of the above four problems that, they, that we talked about. Hear, O oh God, remember our prayer, remember the Lord, walk in the fear of our God. So this focus, he was bringing God into every situation in his own life, led, led to strength and encouragement and godly behavior. And Nehemiah said that the fear of God, recognizing who God is, is what motivated him as well to be steadfast and strong in the task he had undertaken as governor. But another reason was looking at what God would remember about him someday. Think about that. And this is what I missed the whole time I was studying the book of Nehemiah this summer. I didn't, I didn't get it. He was dissociating himself from the behavior of others, not to brag, but because he wanted God to remember him someday for the good, not like the evil going around, on around him. So what kind of remembering was he talking about? Certainly God did remember him. He preserved his account in the most minute details, his words, his actions, the people involved, everything. <clears throat> but he's saying, remember me, God, someday for good. <clears throat> what does, uh, if I asked you, what would you like your family and friends to remember about you, what would I be talking about? Someday when you're gone, what would you like your family and friends to remember you? about you. So, sounds like Nehemiah, Nehemiah is talking about life after death. Remember me, O oh God, for good. Is it correct to think that people in the Old Testament knew about eternal life before Christ came? Uh, is it correct to think that they were motivated by it and hoping for it? Does the Old Testament address this? How would Nehemiah have known about this? Or what would his vision have been? Interestingly, in Jesus' day, there were two leading groups of, of um, Jews, the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in resurrection. The Sadducees were sad, you see, <laughs> because they didn't believe in resurrection. And Jesus corrected them and told them about eternal life. So I started researching it. What would Nehemiah have known? And on the back of your sheet, I put these psalms down, and you might want to mark them. Here's some by David, Psalm 17. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied your like, with your likeness when I awake. Hmm. Talking about when he awakes from death. Psalm 49. But God will redeem my life from the grave. That's pretty clear. He will surely take me to himself. And Psalm 73, yet I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. That's pretty clear. How about Job? Job 19, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. What? What kind of flesh? That sounds like a resurrected body, doesn't it? I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. And Isaiah 26. But your dead will live. Their bodies will rise. I couldn't believe how much I found. You who, you who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. And then Daniel. This one shocked me the most. I'd never seen this one. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, so there's that idea of awakening, some to everlasting life. It's in the Old Testament, everlasting life. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Eternal life, everlasting life. If you go over into the New Testament, Hebrews 11, it says Abraham followed God's call to leave his home and go to a land not knowing where he's going because... He was, looking, he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. What kind of city is that? And then here in Hebrews 11, uh, verse 26, Moses disregarded regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward, an eternal life where God's going to look at what you did. And just in case you didn't get the heavenly focus, um, 
Hebrews, can, uh, Hebrews 11 concludes with this verse. All these people, people who were willing to suffer and even die for their faith when their enemies came against them. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted then that they were aliens and strangers on earth. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Nehemiah, I want to say, focused on and aligned his life with God and will, God's will, and also the hope of eternity and eternal rewards. I want to share in closing just a little illustration, and I come back to it again and again. If you've been in Insights for a long time, I've shared this before, once or twice, I don't know. But uh, I heard this when I was quite young, and it never left me. Somebody said, this is, this is how you should think about eternity. Picture the earth, a solid steel ball, clear through, solid steel. And there's this bird. And the bird is flying around the earth. And it makes a tire flight around the earth as fast as a bird can fly. And after, it gone, it, after it's gone around the earth one, it dips its wing and touches the earth with its feather. And then it flies around the earth again. And the second time around the earth, it dips its wing touches the earth with its feather. How long would it take to wear that steel, wall ball, steel ball down? And she said, that's a picture of eternity. And I thought about it. I thought, no, not quite. Because theoretically, there's an end to that. So I thought, OK, the whole solar system has to be steel balls. And it has to fly around all the planets and the sun. I thought, no, theoretically, there's an end to that. So I thought, OK, the universe, all the stars, they can't even, billions, gazillions of stars, they can't even, they don't even know how big it is. Every star, every whatever has to be steel, and the bird has to fly around them all. There we go. There's eternity. And I thought, no. Theoretically, there's an end to that. So I thought, OK, after that universe, you've got to have another universe, and then another one. And the minute he finishes that one, another one pops, and it never stops. That's eternity. Can you, can you conceive of that? You can't conceive of it, can you? Your mind just, it just blows your mind. And what kind of eternity? The, even, the Old Testament even talks about the nature of eternity. Here's one in Psalms, David. You will make known to me the paths of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Every day, every second, wonderful, beyond description. Every second. No pain, no disease, no decay, no death. I tell my grandchildren, when we get to heaven, I'm going to be as young and cute as you. <laughs> forever. And here's my favorite description of eternity, Ephesians 2, 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable, it means exceeding, surpassing riches of his grace expressed in his kindness or goodness to us in Christ Jesus. So every moment is God expressing his kindness and goodness out of the bounty of the incomparable riches of his grace. Try and explain that one. Who wants to miss that? Who wants to miss that? Such knowledge, you get to the point. When you, when you really start to just even get a glimpse of that, I think I feel like, David, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too lofty for me to attain. That's when you know you've gotten close to touching a little bit of God, when you, when you blow your mind like that. A focus on God gives courage and strength for this life here and now. It gives us a way out, out from fears that paralyze us. Remembering God's loving care and presence encourage us to keep moving forward in his will for our lives. And a hope of heaven and eternity, what does that do? I believe, me, believe it gives us a perspective that makes anything we face here on earth bearable. It gives purpose and direction, even in suffering and it makes everything worthwhile. Over in uh, Hebrews 6, when he's talking about this hope of heaven, he says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. 
firm and secure. When the winds and waves of life are tossing us here and there, it, I heard one man said, it can stink sometimes, but you always know it's going to be okay. You always know it's going to be okay. Threatening to destroy us, discouraging us at every turn, we have an anchor for our soul. We focus on God and cast our cares on him because he loves us so. And we look ahead and put our hope in him for the incomparable riches of eternity. That focus and hope overcomes discouragement every time. And we can move on filled and fulfilling the will of God in our lives. There is no other answer. There is no other hope. There are temporary things that people run to, but there is no permanent hope to anything in this life that discourages us. It, there's no other place to turn for peace in the storm, for undying hope. And in this world, Jesus said, you will have tribulation. Earth is not heaven. We haven't gotten there yet. But fear not, I have overcome the world. Let me close in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are just wonderful. That you are anything and everything we need for all our hurts and fears and any challenge we are facing. Help us to know that we can run to you every time this day, trusting that we will find the strength and the guidance and the hope that only you can give. And I thank you, Lord, that you are our rock, our fortress, our stronghold, our refuge, our place of safety, our strength, and our song, and that you, in you we find unfailing love, tender mercies, boundless grace, great compassion, and eternal hope. And we thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen.